questions of doom. Hello and welcome back to another Questions of Doom! <laughs> In this series, as ever, I attempt to answer questions that you send my way using the archivesuper at gmail.com email address as displayed on the YouTube channel homepage, but as you'll also see at the end of this video. In answering these questions by video, it is my fond hope that the answer is not only useful to the person who's asked the question, but also anyone else out there who may be wondering the same thing. Now today's question is fairly short and sweet, and hopefully the answer will be two. It goes something like this. Dear Mr. Soup, I've been watching the new Sit Sky series Fortitude, in which a mammoth was discovered. Mm. I'll have to take your word for that. I'm afraid Mrs. Soup and I don't have Sky, um, despite the best efforts of those cold callers. Anyway, um, <laughs> we all know that you, archaeologists, don't do dinosaurs, but which speciality would deal with the discovery of a mammoth? Uh, yours faithfully, Colin. Well, Colin, you ask a very good question. Um, lots of people would just say, oh, it's going to be archaeologists, obviously, but it's a bit more subtle than that. And there's a very straightforward answer to your question, but with a little bit of discussion in addition to it. So I'll, I'll cut straight to the chase. Recently, actually, there was the discovery of a very impressive mammoth carcass frozen uh, in, in, in extremely, extremely well-preserved condition. It's just it, a beautiful, beautiful carcass. It had meat and flesh and things that usually dry out or disappear in other mammoth preservation sites as it were. Um, so it's very very exciting. In fact someone at the site even ate a bit of the flesh. Um, you know the first person to eat mammoth in thousands of years. Very very cool. Uh, <laughs> but the person who was doing the research really on the mammoth and who, who was fronting it up on say Russell Howard's Good News or um, any number of uh, news or chat shows and this kind of thing was uh, a paleontologist called uh, Tori Herridge or Victoria Herridge. Now she works at the National Natural History Museum and uh, that is sort of your answer. Paleontologists deal with ancient or in many cases extinct life forms. But it's not that simple. You see, she's also a, a huge advocate of uh, archaeology and archaeologists, and especially women archaeologists. Um, she was very much inspired by archaeological literature, it seems. If you watch the Russell Howard show, you'll know what I mean. Um, <laughs> I won't go into that. But, um, but also as well, actually, this is where paleontologists and archaeologists have lots of common ground. See, archaeologists aren't just interested in are human artifacts and human culture. We're interested in everything that sort of it touches and the context of it as well. And this is why there were so many different specialities within the field of archaeology. Um, there are as many specialities really as there are facets uh, to, 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 to reality um, within archaeology. Um, so, for example, one of my favourite lecturers at university a chap called Peter Rowley Conway, and um, Peter is uh, a self-confessed pig expert. He loves the transition from wild boar, as it were, into pigs, the domestication of these animals, and studying that using bones. And that's very, you can see that's a very direct link with uh, uh, with human culture. There's a, a, a constant connection there, because um, people are affecting the animal. Um, but he also, as well, has a huge interest in uh, sort of the Pleistocene uh, era animals which are no longer around. The Pleistocene was sort of the climactic epoch leading up to pretty much the end of the last ice age and we're now in sort of the Holocene, the follow-up, the thawing event after around about 12,000 uh, BC. Um, but he's interested in animals like mammoth, like giant deer, like aurochs, uh, and in fact in, in the past he's had conversations with students about um, Pleistocene Park, as he puts it. Never mind Jurassic Park, he would say. Pleistocene Park is where it's at, because this is actually where human beings interacted with these amazing, sometimes monstrous creatures. Now this can have dramatic effects in archaeology. For example, was it the Meserik mammoth bone huts, um, where uh, where people are literally made houses, their 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 dwellings out of the remains of animals, out of mammoth. Um, there are really dramatic kill sites where mammoth are sort of herded over cliffs, and uh, clearly it seems you know 
by human action and then butchered where they fall at the bottom of the cliff. Uh, it can result in the, some of the most dramatic archaeological sites that, that one can find. And this is where there's lots of crossover because he is a bones expert, uh, especially sorry, in particular sorry, animal bones expert. Um, but all of this stuff touches on and, and it is existing around the world of human culture and human society. So he is an archaeologist, he's not a paleontologist, but he's still very interested in mammoth, uh, I believe. Um, he's got some very interesting mammoth related bones in his office, for example. Um, and and this, is, this, is, this is the reason why the answer isn't really all that straightforward. The short answer is yes, a paleontologist for the most part, especially when it comes to those biological remains, because that's strictly speaking, studying the, the physiology of the animal and trying to come up with, with answers to biological questions about that species, about that creature. And this is why the Natural History Museum is taking, uh, it seems, a lead on that particular research. But the implications, the impact and the context of that animal has to include human society in most respects, uh, most instances. And, uh, and that's why archaeologists have an awful lot of overlap. And actually many archaeologists will basically be paleontologists. They just tend towards human society in their research. So hopefully that's sort of gone some way to answering your question. Now very briefly, just coming back to the idea of Pleistocene Park, this is a question that fascinates me. Would that be um, possible? Could you do that? Could you actually uh, clone these animals and have them exist, say maybe in the, the northern reaches of Russia, or possibly choose an area in Scotland, try and put them there, or in, you know, in Sweden, northern Sweden, this kind of thing. Could it be possible? Possibly, yes. But it might not. In fact, it wouldn't really work, I don't think, anyway. Partly because these creatures wouldn't have parents to teach them how to be mammoth for example you know the baby mammoth not only would it be a clone essentially and also probably largely based on elephant dna we'd have to sort of plug in gaps using modern uh, creatures but also there's be, there'd be no mummy mammoth or daddy mammoth to teach the mammoth how to mammoth <laughs> so you wouldn't really end up with a mammoth and this is this is the central problem of those pleistocene park and jurassic park questions is that the creatures Okay, yes, an awful lot of that stuff will be genetic instinct, but again, if you're splicing in elephants, it's going to have impacts on that. But also, there's no mammoth culture for it to be in. The same goes for uh, aurochs or giant deer. And actually, specifically with mammoth, it seems that they actually cultivated a landscape which is unique to that time and place. Uh, they didn't, uh, they, what's, it's, it's what's been described as a patchwork, like a tartan patchwork of vegetation. They would almost farm the landscape through their presence. A bit like elephants have an impact, an undeniable impact on the landscape where they live. They knock down trees, they, you know, they, they, they affect the, the, the environment that they're living in. Um, mammoth, it seems, would do similar. And this would, this would mean that they'd have the food that they wanted available, but also it would, it would, um, it, it's, an, it, it's an environment that doesn't exist anymore today. And so therefore would the mammoth, for example, know to create that environment? It's a fascinating question. Lots of ethics, ethical uh, hurdles in the way. Not least, as, as, of course, as well, if we extend that even further and go to maybe the idea of cloning Neanderthal or Neanderthals, could that happen? Probably could. Should it happen? Probably not. Now, I love the idea of it. I love the idea of doing the Pleistocene Park and, for example, uh, study, getting a chance to study or be near Neanderthals. Problem is, is though, that we have enough we have a hard enough time dealing with different colour skin, gender differences, disabilities, uh, cultural constructs, uh, nationality, um, religious uh, feuds. We have a hard enough time dealing with our own species, never mind something which is almost like us living in a protected park somewhere. We'd either try to kill it, we don't, we'd possibly try and uh, mate with it, <laughs> or we, uh, more likely than not, would end up subjecting it to some fairly cruel um, experiments. Um, I think it would be ethically very, very dodgy. And also, again, you have that problem of who would teach it. There are no Neanderthals to teach the Neanderthal to be a Neanderthal. There are no, uh, there are no existing constructs for it to be born into. Uh, and I think that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a, a concept that you can't really let go of. 
And this is really where we come back to the original question. <laughs> Why do we have both archaeologists and paleontologists interested, say, in mammoth? And that's because actually to answer the question that the, the mystery of the mammoth, the riddle of mammoth, a bit like Conan the Barbarian, the riddle of steel, uh, the riddle of mammoth, um, it, to answer that question properly, you have to have both the biological, the mechanical, as it were, the, the genetic and, uh, and physiological evidence, but you also have to have the, the context, and that, in, that includes environmental studies, which is an archaeological thing. It includes uh, the, the cultures, the human cultures which surround the mammoth. That's archaeology again. It includes um, uh, not just environment, but also climatological uh, analysis. That's again in the remit of archaeology. And this is why both specialities, all these different specialities, sorry, both come under the, the remit and the purview and the umbrella of archaeology, but also reach beyond it as well. Because obviously there are climate scientists who aren't archaeologists, there are paleontologists who aren't archaeologists, there are anthropologists who strictly aren't archaeologists. Archaeology is a wonderful sub subject and it touches on all this beautiful, beautiful different types of science. And the mammoth really is a case study in, in where archaeology uh, meets other sciences in the middle, as it were. So hopefully, Colin, this has uh, been a good answer to your question. It was a good question. And uh, I really look forward, actually, to seeing what comes out of that mammoth find, because it was very, very interesting. Um, and, uh, I don't know, discovering a mammoth. An interesting way to start a TV show. Of course, as ever, please do comment below if you have any thoughts or comments that you'd like to share, uh, or indeed you'd like Colin or myself to read. Uh, I certainly will be taking a look. But, um, yeah, it's been an interesting, interesting little case study as the mammoth. Nonetheless, as ever, guys, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.